Well, I talk to a lot of people over the years and um, I try to be neutral many times. And if I'm not, I explain that I'm not. So there are times when I talk about uh, the individual retirement account type situations, IRAs, 401ks, things like that. And um, I'm doing this video because I'm really intending to, to bash these things. All right. And I don't, I'm doing this separately because I'm not talking to someone individually. I'm just going to give you my opinion on these types of investment accounts. Um, and so I'm going to continue in my one-on-one -on -one consultations. I'm still going to try to, you know, tell you that I'm biased, but I want to try to honor the purpose for which you decided to put your money aside in an IRA or a 401k because you probably had some pretty good plans. And um, most of the time I tell people, stick with your plan unless you're too young. Or, okay, so that means uh, if you have so many years, I don't know how many that would be for you. It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years before you're gonna retire. You may wanna consider not putting, you know, committing so much to an IRA. And I think those days are uh, cl coming to a close, but just let's assume they're not for the sake of this conversation here. Um, but generally speaking, an IRA is a trick. It's a trick. An individual retirement account is not, I mean, I, I know the word investment is associated with the IRA, the 401k. When I say IRA, I mean all of them, 401k, all these, 403b, whatever. If someone else is making decisions about where that, that money that you, that came from you, that came from your labor, that came from your idea, okay, if someone else is making decisions about where to reinvest or invest or manage or how to manage that money, then it's not really yours. It's not your investment. It's someone else's investment. Someone else is making those decisions based on whatever criteria and chances are it's gonna be for his or her own interest or the interest of an, another institution, not your family's, okay? That's, that's the first thing. But if you make a decision to set aside cash, you're saving cash. You're setting it aside in an economy that you've seen for the last, the last 40 or 50 or 60 years. You've witnessed this. Now, if you're 30 years old, you, can, you have a chance to go back and look in, in the 70s and 60s through history. You can see what's happened in 60 years. I don't care if you're 30. You can still see what's going on for the last 60 years. So the IRA is this concept that you can put money aside and save it for retirement. And you're, uh, it assumes you're going to get a certain return on the money. And you just have to know that, I mean, you can go look and check the numbers yourself, but you're pretty much getting negative return. You're pretty much giving money away. Not only that, you're missing opportunities. So for example, if, if you're going to get, let's say you're going to get 12% of a year, which is outrageous. No one's getting 12% a year on an IRA. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that's nothing compared to what you could get on your own, including making mistakes. I can tell you, my friends can tell you that we could take 10 grand, 50 grand, and, and we can put it somewhere, and we've done this before, we, we, we've lost it, okay? And then we go and figure out how to get another 50 grand or 25 grand, and we put that somewhere else, and we make a million bucks out of it, or we make 500,000 out of it, and we do that again, and we keep doing that again. And you have all these chances to keep doing this, and so you just have to use um, traditional principles, all right? Don't invest the rent money, right? Um, use other people's money, use other people's resources, joint ventures. Uh, you know, these are traditional principles that you would want to follow. And it's exciting. And yeah, it takes some learning. And um, it, it, it's uh, sometimes you lose sleep over it, uh, especially when you're new at it. You know, you think the world is over if you, if you lost money. And then maybe hopefully in a few months, you look back and you, you decide that that was your tuition. All right, that's what we call it. If you lose money in something, it's your tuition. But I would much rather have the freedom of using my own money. And I think most entrepreneurs and people who become investors would want the freedom of using their own money and not solely for the purpose of putting their money aside for a tax benefit way, way, way down the road. Who knows if you're even gonna live that long, right? So it's just, it's a trick. It's a way to get you to have less cash, set it aside, and, and keep it out of play, right? Not only are you keeping it out of play, but the people behind the IRA scheme, as I call it, are using your money for their own purposes. Where you are thinking you're told, this is for your retirement. This is a responsible thing to do. My dad would say that. This is a responsible thing to do. Put money aside for your retirement. And I remember in, um, gosh, I think I was, I think I was 20 years old and I had this job. 
it was at Telecredit and um, it was a division of Equifax, I think it ultimately became. But anyways, it was kind of like a risk management insurance type industry. Uh, and I, I was promoted. And I, I went to the orientation for all the new full-time employees. And uh, I was the youngest guy in the room. I, th I, was, I was like 20. I think everybody else was like 35 or something like that. And uh, there was like eight of us. And we were being told about all these different things we can get into, like life insurance and IRAs and all this stuff. And even then, I didn't even have a clue back then. But I just knew, I'm not going to let these fools use my money for anything. I don't care what you promise me. I would rather give them my whole check. And it's, I'll just barely let you take out social security. I didn't know how to, you know, get out, get around that back then. And I remember after the meeting, I felt really out of place at the meeting because I, I was, I kept being presented with these contracts to so sign up, sign here, sign here. And they were sending all these documents out on this big boardroom table. And I, I would just not do them. I would just read them and I go, nah, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and, and, and when the person conducting the orientation realized I was not participating like everyone else was, um, she started focusing on me and asking me, hey, are you sure, John? Don't you want to you know, consider this? It's going to be a good thing. And I was like, no, thanks. I'm, I'm fine. I just want to get my paycheck and I, and I could decide what to do from there and I'll figure it out. And uh, I went back. I remember it was like a four-hour orientation. I went back to my, um, my uh, area and my boss called me in her office. And apparently the person doing the orientation had called her. Now, my boss is great. I, I love her. She just did a great job. She was one of my favorite people to work with. And uh, so I really respected her. So she called me in the office and she said, you know, John, um, these things are for, you know, she was 20 years older than me too. And so she's trying to tell me, just like my parents would tell me, you know, do these things and sign up for this life insurance and all this, which I'm not saying life insurance is a bad thing, but when you're 20, you're invincible, right? So who cares about life insurance <clears throat> when you have no dependents or anything like that? So uh, she tried to get me into it too. And she meant well, she meant well, but I never did that. So I just remember that. And I, you know, since then I've never really gotten into the stock market. I never have actually gotten into the stock market. I never bought stock. I feel like that's gambling. I always did. I always knew there was something wrong with it. Now, don't get me wrong. People have made lots of money in the stock market and you can certainly make lots of money in the stock market. It just takes a, a certain knowledge base. For me, for myself, I would just rather develop a, a knowledge base that I found more challenging and interesting which involves joint venturing, um, taking my cash or trying to get someone else to use his cash for my idea. And just, it's a lot of fun. I mean, use my cash for someone else's idea, joint venture, take my knowledge base, do a contract. You know, I, I've just found that to be a, a lot more rewarding over the years. So back to bashing IRAs. Again, an IRA is someone else's investment. You're funding it. That does not make you the investor. Whoever decides what is being purchased with the IRAs, is the investor. Usually it's an institution, okay? These evil ones you've been, you've been lauding all these years. You've been, not lauding, I should say, you should be, you, you'd be uh, criticizing all these years, okay? For causing the financial collapse that we're witnessing right now. These are the creatures that have been using your IRA money. Now, the IRA pension fund idea, that's worldwide, okay? And it's similar in all the countries. So let me just point something out to you. You guys talk about the mortgage foreclosure crisis. We've had a series of those. Uh, there was a big one, I think it was in 2008, 2009. What, what's behind that? I mean, what, what do you have? Here are the players. You have pension funds, the largest collections of people's wealth, let's call it cash, billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars that's being set aside by consumers that work, that are productive. It's being set aside all over the world in different countries for those individuals' retirement. Well, it's being parked so that they don't get to use it, but the bankers are using it because the bankers tricked everyone into setting aside their money for an investment that's not an investment, for a tax benefit that might come 40 years from now, maybe. So if you're a pension fund manager that's managing $27 billion or $1.5 billion, you're a prospect for investing in funds that are making money, right? You're the fund manager, let's say, or your firm is the fund manager for all these pension funds, IRAs, whatever they call them in Ireland and England. I don't know. They have all these different IRA type, you know, retirement accounts. So someone is managing those funds and that someone is accountable and he has to make decisions about where to spend that money. He has to take those pension fund, that pension fund account, that money, and he has to allocate it into assets. Well, if an organization, let's say Wall Street over there in America, 
is creating, has created uh, a return on investment that's higher, gives more yield than most other investments. As a pension fund manager in the United States and other countries, it behooves you to take your pension money and put it in that fund. Because if you don't, you might get fired. Makes sense, right? So Wall Street sets all this up, creates this world where in which pension fund managers around the world have to get into it. Well, in order for Wall Street to get other governments to let Wall Street offers, securities offers come into those countries, those governments have to approve it. Well, what's in it for those governments to approve it? Well, they got tax money and all this stuff, right? Well, the other part of it is that if governments are gonna let a foreign government business organization come into uh, in a highly regulated uh, financial market, let them come into their country, they're gonna say, well, if you're, we're gonna let you come in here and get a piece of the action here, you're gonna make good on it. You are going to pay if we're gonna let you do that. Oh, and by the way, we want a piece of the action, which they get, right? So the Wall Street funds are sold to foreign pension funds. So the foreign pension funds buy into the Wall Street funds, they have to. Mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, they have to. Your IRA has to. This is, I'm talking from the, really from the 70s, but 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000 up to 2010 or so, they start all changing. So now you're in there, right? So, so now once all this money is, all these pension funds are invested in this fake market, mortgage-backed securities or whatever, this consumer stuff, consumer debt, really, um, it can be stolen. Poof, as it has happened so many times, right? This is what they did. The, the mortgages were used to steal pools of money where they couldn't have done it without the pools of money. You have to promise somebody something that he thinks is valuable before he'll make that financial decision, right? Which they did, retirement. Yeah, it's the right thing to do. And this thing will get, you'll get out of it. And so you will then put your money aside and then that money can then be accessed by the people, the same people that sold you on the idea of putting your money aside. You see how this works? So you take your money out of play. The evil people that convince you of doing that are playing with your money. And yeah, they're gonna steal it. So the IRA, is just a mechanism that was part of the mortgage-backed security scam crisis, whatever you want to call it. There's another segment of the market called asset-backed security. You guys can look this up. Asset-backed security basically is consumer debt. Mortgage-backed security is a, spe a specific kind of consumer debt, which is secure secured debt. And so in order for Wall Street to promise this, yeah, we'll make good on it they had to make arrangements with our court system here in the United States. Now I'm not talking about other countries. I'm just saying, as it turns out here, uh, the mortgages, the instruments themselves are fraudulent. The whole market is, it's all fake. There's no money out there. There's just labor. There's just people that actually work in the real world. And so we can speculate on that. In order to do that, we have to create all these documents, which is what the, the game was. Well, to make good on it, you actually have to take the property. So when you when you rob the pension fund or when you you create an economic situation that causes the foreclosures, that's in fact that's what happened. They created a market situation. Uh, the bankers created economic situations that cause foreclosures. Okay, um, the courts have to be on board with this, and the courts have to agree to uh, honor the mortgage instrument whether it's fake or not, whether it can be proven valid or not, they are going to allow the mortgage holder, whoever claims to be the lender, they're gonna allow them to foreclose no matter what. And I can tell you firsthand, I've, I've had cases where we caught them, we caught them red-handed and they just ignored us and went on and took the house, okay? So this is me bashing IRAs. IRAs are a way to make consumers chumps so that the other evilness that we all like to criticize can be carried out. So we're criticizing something that we're participating in. That's what your IRA is doing. Um, yeah, so let's see. The time value of money. If you just set aside money, and this is what I figured when I was 20. I didn't know exactly how I was gonna do this, but I figured if I'm, 
if I would normally contribute $150 a month, let's say, to some of these funds, and I paid myself $150 a month, I think I could make a lot more money than the fund could ever promise me or ever even come out to be, right? I just think, I just thought that. And I did. It actually worked out that way. I didn't have any plans. I just figured, well, okay, maybe it might take me some work or whatever, some new learning, and I'll, I'll figure it out. So I kind of did that. And I, I really, to this day, I believe that you can make a lot of money. Like you could pick a 10 year period. Let's say you just goof around until you're 35. You don't even take finances seriously. And then when you're 35, you say, okay, I've, I've learned enough. I've, I've looked around. I've, I've had some experience here. I know some people. I'm going to start uh, trying to uh, build something. And my goal is to create a cash flow for myself that equals cash flow that triples what I need to live on. This is very easy to do. Let's say I need $4,000 a month to live on. I can easily create $12,000 a month with the same effort as it takes me to get $4,000. Does that appeal to you over saving money for a whole career lifetime just to get a tax break in a pension fund that someone else is, you're the chump and someone else is using your money for whatever crimes they want to commit? Just because you lack knowledge. Well, you lack knowledge about the IRA, but you went in that direction. You don't know what the sinister underbelly is of the IRA industry or whatever, but you went into it. You, you bought into it, right? Well, I didn't, I didn't know anything about being, uh, doing joint ventures and being an entrepreneur. Um, now I do. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I started making the money I want. You know? So uh, here's a couple of rules to follow. Don't make decisions, financial decisions, for the sole benefit of a tax, a tax break. Uh, generally, um, that's not a good idea. I mean, you're going to run into problems. If there's something that you can get a tax benefit from in the matter of doing some other deal, by all means, uh, do it and get the tax break. Just the same, if there's a way to get a higher return on capital or do some venture and make money with your money or make your money work for you and it costs you in taxes, do it anyways, because your ultimate goal, your priority should be a return on capital not avoiding taxes. It's just like this example. If I'm going to start a business somewhere, let's say I want to, let's say I want to open a donut shop. I'm not going to have a conversation with my investors and my suppliers uh, and my employees and say, okay, guys, I'm opening a donut shop and our first objective is to reduce expenses. That's ludicrous. Right? You understand that. So a business or an investment is to make money, return on capital. If I can have a tax break, fine. But that's uh, uh, by, this, uh, by the way, if I can do that. All right, so there are a couple exceptions. I like to respect the decision that you made to, to get the IRA because you, know, you, you had a family discussion and pro probably, or there was a good reason. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But just know that you're missing opportunities the longer you keep money set aside for a tax benefit, which is years down the road. You're missing many, many opportunities. But maybe that doesn't matter if your net worth is so high. Maybe your net worth is so high. Maybe you've been putting money aside, but you've been also smart about being an entrepreneur. Maybe you invested in some real estate. Maybe you did these other things, right? So no problem. You're gonna not even you're not even gonna miss it. Like for myself, um, I probably I think I think I paid about nine quarters into um social security. What is it, nine, nine years, something like that? I filed returns for nine years, I think. So I had withholding for about nine years of my entire life. So I don't know, maybe I qualify for $150 a month in social security when I finally retire, maybe in 20 years or whatever, when I reach that age in 20 years or so. Um, and I'll, I don't care. I'm never going to ask for that money. I think it's blood money. And that's just my personal uh, view on it. And, and they can have it. I don't want it. Uh, so I'm not going to miss that. And same with um, you know um, IRA money. I don't have any of that. I, don't, I never did want it. I've, I've done pretty well avoiding all those things. So that would be the only exception though, if you're very close, and this is kind of fluid, depends on what you think very close to retirement age means to you. Um, if you're pretty close to retirement age, a few years, within five years, let's say, I would say don't change anything. Just go with the plan that you started 30 years ago. Um, the other, there's a couple other things that go on too. Some employers, they were doing, I don't know if they do this too much anymore, but they were matching funds. So that's almost like free money that you pretty kind of can't ignore, but still it's a hundred percent on your money, which is pretty good. But what's the guarantee that you're going to get it? 
So that's kind of too good to pass up though. And I've recommended that people over the years, just keep it, just keep that matching funds thing going, grow your IRA. Keep in mind that maybe at some point you can borrow money out of your IRA and use it for investing. So try to try to think of something like that if you can do that. So anyways, um, that's my uh, bashing session on IRAs. I will try to be uh, you know neutral when I talk with you individually, but um, really, I, I just think you shouldn't be in IRAs. It's just another way to steal your money. All right. Thanks for listening.